Hello everyone. I once again welcome you all to MSP lecture series on interpretive spectroscopy. So in the last uh, few lectures, I have been solving problems and then finding out solutions by considering problems having data from more than one type of uh, spectra. So let us continue doing that one in this lecture as well. So there is a problem I will read out while running a new reaction a chemist notices the evolution of a gas. A sample of this gas gave a mass spectrum in which the molecular ion m by z equals 44 was the largest ion peak. The only other significant peaks were observed at m by z equals 28 and m by z equals 16. Just for curiosity, it is very easy to predict the gas. The moment gas means probably we will be thinking of uh, CO, CO2, N2 or ethylene, something like that. So, to begin with, to examine this rule number 13 and also hydrogen deficiency, let us go for again testing this molecule having very low mass to charge ratio 44 here, 44. So, we uh, divide by 13 C 3 H will be 5 now, C 3 H 5 is there and then evolution of a gas is there. So, that means basically there should be carbon monoxide if ethylene is a different thing, ethylene does not have. But let us see whether we have because this formula gives C 3 H 5. So, it is little more than. So, let us add one oxygen and see what would happen. For oxygen we have to remove C H 4 plus C 2 H 1. So, this is not actually there should be more 8 it should be because 36 plus 8 is equal to 46. Okay. So, uh, remove that one and then we get H 4 here C 2 H 4 and then what would happen if we remove one more oxygen? It becomes C O 2 and then C H 4 is gone. So, straight away we get this one. This corresponds to 4. So, obviously we can tell this is C O 2 and then observed peak at M is this is C O and then 16 this is 28. So, this information is sufficient uh, to tell that the gas that evolved is CO2. Uh, you can use uh, rule number 13 uh, to arrive at the structure molecule as well. So, simply make it C3H8 and then add 1 O and remove CH4, add 1 more. We are in the C2H8 we are taking out, then we will be left with only 1 and CO2. Okay, easy. It works well with uh, your small molecules. Now, another example is there here. A liquid compound gave a mass spectrum showing a strong molecular ion at m by z equals 156. The only fragment ions are seen at m by z equals 127 and, and 29. The moment we talk about 127, so one element comes to our mind having atomic weight of 127 that is iodine. So, probably iodine is there in this molecule. Let us check. First, we take 156 divided by 13 and it divides completely. So, no reminder is there, 12 is there. So, this is C 12 and H 12 is this. So, now let us say if you want to add iodine, how much I should take out for iodine? Iodine 127 means C 10 H 7. So, 120 plus 7. So, I have to take out C 10 H 7 here. That means C 2 H 5 iodine. Well, if it is C 2 H 5 iodine, one can write this way C H 3 C H 2 iodine. So, it ends here. Yes, possibly this, uh, this is ethyl iodide. It is also very simple, but using this rule and then adding iodine here and taking out equivalent to 127 C 10 H 7 moiety, we can arrive at the structure of ethyl iodide here. And of course, when you look into 1 SNMR, it can show very nicely something like this. This and also 13C will give you two signals. So, next look into the lowest wavelength light visible to the human eye is 390 nanometer. What is the corresponding frequency? It is given in nanometer. 
wave number, then we have to convert into frequency here. We know that lambda equals c by nu and nu equals c by lambda. So, for this one, we have to consider light. Velocity of light is 3 into 10 raised to 8 meters and over 390 into 10 raised to 9 meters. So, now if we divide this one, what we get is 0 0.00769 into 10 raised to 17 here. So, then if remove decimals here and make it 0 0.769, then it should be 10 to, 10 to the power of 14 here. This is per second or we can call it as hertz. So, this is the corresponding frequency in this case. The lowest wavelength light visible to human eye is 390 nanometer. The corresponding frequency is 7.69 into 10 raised to 14 hertz. So, now let us look into one more. In which region of the electromagnetic spectrum is an emission from a neodymium a laser corresponding to a transition between electronic energy levels 11502 and then 2111 centimeter minus. So, we have to find out the energy of this emission between them, the transition between whatever the energy that corresponds to, that means two levels are there. So, we, we have to now what we should do is we have to subtract first or take the difference. that should give you, so 1, this is the 1, so now this corresponding wavelength we have to calculate, this is the wave number, so we know that it is 1 by lambda. So, here 1 by 9391. So, that would be that we get something like this. So, this one if you take out all those things, it, it should come around. We can put here 1.065 One, an R we can put here one for one zero six five we can make it we can remove one zero six five nanometer we can make it so nine it becomes nine ten raised to minus nine so it becomes nanometer here so it will be one zero six five nanometer. So here the corresponding transition energy is 1065 nanometer. Okay. So, now what is the color of the solution giving rise to the spectrum shown below? So, this spectrum is for penta aqua vanadate compound. So, vanadium is in 2 means it is plus 4 state. So, it is in plus 4 states D2 system it is. From this one now uh, let us see whether we should be able to answer this question by looking into this one. So, here if we focus our attention to the absorption between 500 to 1000, 500 to 1000 comes in the red region as well as partly green region. You can see here, it comes around 500 here and then it is coming up to here. So, that means basically what it does is it is absorbing from this portion to this portion. Okay, that means as a result what happens it appears blue here the color of the solution would be blue, this is blue in color. Predict which one of the following complexes will have the more intense DD transitions. Uh, one is cis compound, one is trans compound, both of them have two fluorine and two ethylene diamines. If we look into the structures here, cis one, This is the trans compound. So, 
So one thing we can quickly notice about is uh, inversion center or center of symmetry. So in this one, we have center of symmetry is there, whereas in this case, it, there is no center of symmetry. So now the DD, of course, uh, DD transient itself is Laplace forbidden, but of course, because of mixing of S and P orbitals in a complex, uh, d orbitals are no longer pure d orbitals. They have mixing of p as well as s. As a result, what happens? Laplace allo transitions are seen. Nevertheless, uh, their molar absorptive coefficient is very low. But here, which one will be more intense? So here, if you look into trans compound inversion center is there. So it is forbidden. Whereas here, in this case, considerable amount of mixing is there in case of cis compound. As a result, we can say cis compound is more intense in color compared to trans compound because cis compound lacks inversion center of symmetry whereas trans has inversion center. So now there is another question, what sort of coordination environments would be best for a commercial pigment based on DD transitions in a transmetal complex? I have given some text here. The molar absorptive coefficient is greatest for compounds without an inversion center. That's the reason if you look into compounds having tetrahedral geometry as well as octahedral geometry, again, whether it's homoleptic or heteroleptic. In case of homoleptic, again, tetrahedral compounds lack of inversion center, they are more intense, whereas octahedral compounds, uh, homoleptic ones, they have center of symmetry and they are less intense in nature or Laporte forbidden or they show weak transition. Therefore, among all preferred geometries, if we consider adopted by transmetal complexes, Tetrahedral geometry would be the best suited to think of such complexes as commercial pigments because it doesn't have an inversion center as this would give maximum color per metal center based on the type of DD transition as well. However, for their utility as pigments, the highest color density per metal center is required. That is the primary objective of uh, uh, commercializing any compound as a pigment. So here in this case, the preferred ones are those complexes have charge transfer transitions because most of the charge transfer transitions are very intense and then the highest color density comes per metal and as a result preferred is tetrahedral and also on and above the most preferred ones will be complexes which show charge transfer transitions. There is one more question here. The spectrum of hexachlorotitanate 3 minus has an absorption at 760 nanometer and that of hexafluoro titanate is 518 nanometer and the corresponding bromo is at 877 nanometer. So calculate delta octa in centimeter minus 1 for each of those things and comment on the values. So all these complexes are uh, titanium 3 plus D1 configurations are there and then one can simply by taking the reciprocal of this one, we should be able to calculate the values here. We could take the reciprocal and we have calculated that one. This comes around 11,400 centimeter minus for titanium bromo compound, 13,000 for chloro compound and 19,300 for fluoro compound here. And of course, when we look into this data, we can you know recollect the position of these halides in the spectrochemical series. It gives this information here. So relative strength of these ligands can also be obtained directly from these values. And of course, I have also given an extended spectrochemical series here. And this is also I have given in the beginning also while discussing about UV spectra of D1 to D10 system. So now here one more example is there. Electronic absorption spectra of uh, hexa aqua nickel 2 plus and uh, tris ethylene diamine nickel 2 plus are shown below determine delta octa for these two complexes and the electronic spectra are given here, this one. What you should see here is both are octahedral nickel 2 complexes and both are D8 system and if the D8 system is there and of course they show three spin allow transitions. I already told many times while discussing UV visible spectroscopy that D1, D4, D6 and D9 show one single DD transition because all of them were put into one group because D1 has one electron and D4 has one less than half field, D6 has one more than half field and then D9 has one less than completely field. So all of them were put into one group and they showed invariably one DD transition whereas 
d2, d3, d7, d8. All of them again they can be put into another category like having two electrons less than half, two electrons less than half filled, two electrons more than half filled and two electrons less than completely filled d2, d3, d7, d8, they show three transitions. So, now d8 nickel belongs, nickel is a d8 system, nickel 2 plus d8 system, it belongs to this one. So, here in this one, the from the spectrum, what you can notice is uh, we are seeing here, if you just see here, this is the first one here, the first one here, we are seeing this one in case of nickel compound here, this shows 8000 approximately 500 centimeter minus 1. And then whereas in case of uh, this one, it is coming here, this for this, it is coming around 11,250 centimeter minus 1. So, therefore, occur for nickel compound is 8,500 centimeter minus 1. And then for this one, this is equal to delta root of n i 2 plus. Of course, uh, one can also look into D8 Tanube Sugano diagram also to see because there we are keeping all the ligands are there and, and one can also see uh, what kind of transitions we come across and how to determine delta O. So, one more spectrum is given, uh, one more problem is given here. Uh, the spectrum of hexamine rhodium 3 plus has two DD transitions 32,800 and 39,200 centimeter minus and in the spectrum of iridium NH363 plus they are at 39,800 and 46,800 centimeter minus 1. You estimate delta of for these complexes and compare the values to that of hexamine cobalt. We know cobalt, rhodium, iridium, they are all D7 S2 system. All of them are D7 S2 system. We are going from 3D to 4D to 5D here and here is cobalt, rhodium and iridium. So, 3D, 4D, 5D system here and then how to calculate that one? So, to calculate delta after what we should do is we should take the difference of these two and then one quarter of that one should be added to the lowest one. So, that would give you approximately delta O. So, for example, 32,800 subtract from this one, we get 6,400. So, divided by 4, it will be about 1,600 plus 32,800. So, this would give you 34,400. So, this this is nothing but delta O for rhodium 3. Here rhodium is in uh, 3 system. So, D6 system it is. D6 system you know that it will show only one transition and it is showing 2 transitions here. Same calculation we can do here also 46,800 minus 39,800, it is uh, 7,000. 4 times will be 1750. 1750 plus if we add 39,800, so that would give this one fourth of this one. That would give you 41,550 centimeter minus 1, that is equal to octahedral value of iridium 3 plus. So, that means now if we just compare cobalt, cobalt value is given is 23,000. So, then if we if we look into rhodium, it is 34,400 and then if you go for this is cobalt, this is rhodium and this is iridium will be 41,550 minus 1. So, this one can very nicely explain. When we when we go from 3D to 4D to 5D, what basically happens is your uh, crystal free stabilization energy increases. Why that happens? As we go down, higher orbitals are there, the orbitals become larger in size. When they are larger in size, the greater the difference between the extent of interaction 
of the T2G and EG orbital and then increase in the energy between T2G and EG is possible as a result of this one and hence what happens delta increases down the group. So, I think uh, let me stop today and consider more problems in my next lecture. So, what you should remember is of course, we are considering cobalt, rhodium, iridium, 3D, 4D, 5D and also the values also you can see here calculated. So, it is very simple if two transitions are there and take the difference of the transition and then consider one fourth of that one and add that one to the lower absorption band that is 30 to 800 in case of rhodium and 39,800 in case of iridium and then that would give you the corresponding octahedral delta value for the corresponding metal complex. And then you can compare of course, 3D to 4D to 5D we know that the incremental increase is there in the spectral perturbation energy and then the reason is what happened the increase in the size of orbitals. So, let me stop now and continue in my next lecture. Thank you.